All right. Okay, so, so hopefully this works and we can get Andrea on and we'll go ahead and get started in just a minute. Um, while I'm waiting for her to jump in, I'm going to go ahead and just have you guys, if you have any questions, go ahead and um, comment below and we will try to answer those as quickly as possible. Yay, there you are, Andrea. I still can't do it as the page, but I'm here. So. <laughs> yeah, I know, I don't know what the deal is, so I'm gonna have to figure that out. <laughs> I'm gonna go quickly share it to the page, so that way at least they know where to find us. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I did set it up to share it on homeschool.com, so I'm hoping that is actually showing up there. Oh, heck. <laughs> that I can do. No, it's been crazy. Yeah, I don't. Okay, it, that it, was the weirdest thing ever because it told me I was already live, and I was really confused. <laughs> I got really scared. Oh boy. <laughs> So for some reason, every time I do a Facebook Live, something really weird happens. I don't understand what you I'm doing. Are sharing on the page or on homeschool.com. Yeah. So I will share us. Yay. Good. All right. So I just want to say hi, everyone. I'm Jamie with homeschool.com, and I want to welcome everybody to our new help series entitled The Homeschool Helping Hand. We're hoping that the series will really, obviously, because of its title, be a helpful resource for homeschooling parents. And so the plan is every week we'll do a Facebook Live similar to this one, and we'll have different guest speakers. And so today our guest speaker is Andrea Dillon, and she Hi. is the um, admin and the face of home, uh, not homeschool. <laughs> I can't even talk today. A to Z homeschooling.com. You can find her there. I encourage you to visit her. She has a wonderful website and it's full of really good resources for homeschoolers. Lots of great information. And I, I think Andrea is pretty great because she not only is a homeschool mom to two kids, but she is a single mom. So I feel like she gets the big cookie. She is a superhero in my book. Perpetually tired. There it is the actual term, perpetually tired. I get it. So of course, those of you who are joining us, if you have any questions specifically along those lines, I know Andrea would be super glad to answer them and talk to that today. All right, so to kind of get our feet wet today, um, you know, until we get some questions and you guys, I, I see several people on with us, uh, I encourage you to ask us questions. Um, all you have to do is stick them in the comments and we will do our best to answer your questions. Look, we're getting some. Yay. Can you see them, Andrea? I can see them too. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Now my only issue is I don't have like a place where I can respond there, but we can, we can see you ladies. Um, Francis and Griselda, we're so glad you're here. Griselda says, I am currently doing distant remote learning with my children's district. However, I'm ready to transition to a full homeschool program. Cool. I'm not sure where to start or which curriculum is best. Any help or suggestions would be greatly appreciated. Please. That sounds great. Um, so yes, we are going to dig into that. Um, that is a really big question yeah. though. So if you'll give us a minute to kind of get our feet wet and then we will answer that <laughs> question in full in its entirety. Um, <laughs> so just as an introduction, I know I'll, like, just, just like Griselda, a lot of our, um, the people that are joining us today, maybe just starting in the middle of the year. And that's, that is absolutely cool. You know what, I did wanna mention that we did a survey um, like within the last year of current homeschoolers and they, the question was, when did you start homeschooling? Did you start at the beginning of a typical school year or did you start in the middle of the year? And 40% of all the respondents said they started in the middle of the homeschool oh. year. 
So those of you, yeah, is that all? Awesome? <laughs> I, I can believe it. So. so those of you who are just now starting in January, you aren't alone. You, are, <laughs> you may feel a little bit like you're alone, but you're not alone. Other people have started in the middle of the year as well. So um, Andrea and I, just to give you a little background, Andrea has two kids. Um, I had six kids. I'm not homeschooling all six right now. I have four that have actually graduated from our homeschool, our homeschool program. And um, they've gone on to either college, university, or tech school. And so between the two of us, I think we're both yes. education backgrounds. Yes. Yeah, so we love so, yes. yeah, we've left teaching and we have turn to teaching our own children and investing in our own children. And so I'm sure there are some people out there that can probably relate to that. Seems like a lot of teachers tend to do that. A lot of, especially <laughs> now, <laughs> um, a lot of my personal emails are, are filled with people that I went to school with or that I taught with that are, Hey, how can I start? So, <laughs> so yes, that is something that's becoming more and more of a thing. So <laughs> we're not alone. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I'm and they're all in the middle of the year too. So, so that they're the double whammies. Right. Absolutely. So just kind of, um, a couple things I want to throw out there. Those of you who are new, who are just starting, um, you know, we kind of skirted around the issue that you might feel a little bit like you're alone. And I do want to encourage you that even though, you know, a lot of people, a lot of states, the, the regulations differ between states as far as the quarantine and the pandemic and what you can and can't do. But I do want to encourage you to get connected uh, somehow, get connected either, you know, locally, there's usually some type of homeschooling group in your area. Uh, so I would do some search and see if you can find something. I know Andrea's website has a section for support. And I can speak to the, the secular homeschool crowd because A to Z is, we are secular in nature. Um, a lot of people immediately want to find their group. They want to find the place that they fit perfect in. When you're starting out, don't look for perfect. <laughs> look for people that can kind of help you get your feet wet, get started, get you information, get you the right laws, the right section that you need to be at in your, your state. Don't look for your perfect at first. You're not going to find perfect immediately. It's a rare, rare unicorn. But start just looking for what's there. It may not be your perfect secular or whatever group that you would love to ideally have, but start start with what you have. And then you can branch out from there once you kind of get your feet on the ground. Right. Yeah. Definitely. And just to throw this out in case you don't know, homeschool.com kind of leans more to the conservative Christian crowd. And so here's a perfect example. I mean, we're two homeschool mamas who find that common ground in the fact that we're homeschooling and we don't have to agree about everything, mm -hmm. but we still find it. <laughs> we have the same dilemmas across the board. Exactly. <laughs> still the same questions, exactly. still the same things that we face every day. So um, I just wanted to encourage you guys with that. And homeschool.com also has a support group section too where you can search and find local, local stuff. Um, hi, Sarah. We're glad you've joined us. And we are going to get to those questions in just a second. We're kind of doing some preliminary stuff. Um, a couple things that, okay, so I mentioned support groups, getting connected. That's really important. Um, another thing I just wanted to throw out there in case you feel like there are some things you can't do as a homeschool mama. Um, there are some things like, uh, homeschool co-ops, if you hadn't heard of them. Um, another kind of cool thing there, and it's really a co-op kind of, um, just a, with a different name there, these learning pods. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure if we talked about that, Andrea, but they're basically like this group um, you know, and we're in a, we are in a pandemic. I understand that, but this is like a group that you socialize with. So these are people that you hang with or they're your people, they're your bubble, so to speak. And they call them a learning pod. And so you guys get together and, and do your, do some things like a homeschool co-op together. Um, they also call sometimes they'll call them micro schools and don't underestimate the online versions of exactly. these are starting to pop up more and more. If you have questions, your best bet's to look at your local library. They tend to be the hub that can kind of point you in the right direction. I know our small, small library where I'm at, we actually kind of have our own group 
sort of for STEM and science. And so that that came out of COVID precautions. We took our STEM, our STEAM group and moved it on online. A lot of homeschool cups and homeschool groups are doing the same thing. So if you find them online, you know, find a number, find an email, send them a message. If they don't have one started, they might be willing to yeah. do one. Um, with Facebook Live and things like this, it's a lot easier to connect with people. <laughs> that's, that's a one perk, a COVID perk. We have found technology is hard, but we have found multiple ways to connect with others. Right, right. Um, okay, so getting to some of these questions, um, Sarah asks, what is a good way to assess how much your kids are picking up and when to start moving them up in subjects? Oh boy. <laughs> um, observations your best bet always if you're watching them and it's too easy then try something a little harder um, if you go too far you'll know they'll get frustrated you'll hit a wall um, mm -hmm. and don't be afraid to go backwards if you need to go back and review and do that's fine standards for schooling are flexible homeschooling is flexible don't feel the need to be at a surface a specific point at a specific time you're going by your kids guides this is an individualized learning for them so let them kind of move at their own pace but um it's really easy to find out when it's too easy they're done really fast you know <laughs> right. most of the days you get i'm finished in 20 minutes so yeah <laughs> that that is definitely an indicator Sarah and then if they if what they're doing is boring to them yes. yeah so you've got to have that a wise older homeschool mom told me this one time you have to have this balance of struggle and delight the struggle is the challenge trying to get them you know to rise to that challenge to grow and the delight is you know finding things that they enjoy and that they find really fun um so i kind of i try to keep that as my rule of thumb in almost any area so when i'm even planning you know what are we going to learn or what are we going to study this year i want to have those things that i know they're going to struggle they're going to be challenged with but yet I want to give them delight too, so that they're just like, oh, wow, this is really cool. I want to wake up tomorrow and I want to do something really cool again. <laughs> so the, the um, struggle and delight works very well <laughs> as a rule. Curriculum you're using as well. A lot of them do have some kind of assessment yeah. built in so that kind of can give you a guide point on how well they're doing, what they need help with. So it depends on if you are piecemealing it together, more of an unschool, mm -hmm. eclectic type, or if you have a curriculum for a specific subject. You can kind of go by a lot of their benchmarks too on what they're able to hit when you need to move further a little bit. Right, absolutely. And so, you know, that's another thing. As you, as you homeschool a while, you get to know your children. You get to know what makes them tick and what they want to learn. Um, you know, I'm sure between the two of us, we've used all kinds of different homeschool curriculums yes. because not one ever works for everything. When that's, that's kind of my number one tip for anyone starting. Don't go buy the big expensive box yeah. thing immediately. Oh, yeah. Just don't, we have done it. Don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to, it's going to sit in your closet and it's going to be there forever. And you're going to hate the fact that you spent X amount of dollars on yeah. it. Okay. Your first, your first bit needs to be experiment it's trial and error you're going to you know try the samples reach out to people even if they're not specifically your group of homeschoolers reach out find what they use see what's popular what's not um and kind of let your kid lead you with what they want to do if they like computer learning then kind of lean towards that way if they like more paperwork if they like a combination of both there's plenty that do both if they want more hand-on versions um and, and even if you are doing something like out school or something on the lines of that, you know, take small chunks, <laughs> small, small to chunks. Don't buy your K through 12 now and say, I'm set for life because <laughs> it's going to change. Your kids are going to grow. Things are going to be different. What worked this year is not going to work. You know, three years from now, they're going to be different kids. They're going to probably have jumped way beyond where you thought they were going to be, or they might struggle in areas that you never expected. So, you know, pre-planning is great, but yeah. <laughs> Take, take it in small pieces. <laughs> sometimes, uh, sometimes when I, well, let me just say it this way. I have learned by my mistakes that if I pre-plan too much, I end up 
throwing away my planner <laughs> because exactly. Exactly. Too much to erase and fix. So I've learned I make a general year outline, really general. And then I do plan by week just because from day to day, you know, doctor's appointments crop mm -hmm. up, and life happens. So, you know, anything more than a week really is just up in the air because of I'm a little more flexible than you are. I kind of have yeah. monthly goals. <laughs> <laughs> but see that's the thing that's I think we're both trying to say this is that yes. as you get into this groove you become the expert yes. in your homeschool and you know what works for your kids what works for you your home and your family and your needs and so that's what I, I hope we can encourage all of our listeners today that they will become the expert at their exactly. well and that's the the most important it's your homeschool your homeschool right. does not look like everyone's homeschool because it's yours it's right. not going to look like everyone else's it may look similar to some but it's yeah. not going to be you know we're we're not cookie cutter homeschool that's that's not what it's about so you're not going to be exactly the same as someone else. all right so and don't <laughs> let's go back and let's try yeah. to answer griselda's question and then we'll come to we have another sarah on so hi other sarah um and she's asking about how so um, <laughs> I, I, hope I figured you'd, you'd I'm not there yet. <laughs> um, I, I do want to mention uh, to the second Sarah that we will be doing specific Facebook lives during the month, month of March and April this year that are dedicated completely to high school to finding out what your what your high school student wants to do in their future to alternatives to college which homeschoolers are, let me just say, awesome at alternatives to college. Um, there's some amazing opportunities there. And then also college prep and college admissions. And we're going to have some speakers speak to those things that um, some of my favorites that have helped me with my four kids. Um, so I want you to just know about that. I thought that I'd just give you that public service announcement there before we go on with all the other stuff. But we're going to get to that. We'll, we will answer some questions that you ask here specifically, but then I want you to know in March and April, there'll be a lot of really good stuff specific to high school. Okay, so Griselda wants to know how to tr transition um, from the remote learning with her school into starting to homeschool full time. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't know where to start or what curriculum is best. So we kind of touched on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is no best. Right. There is not a blanket best across the board. Um, there are some really great ones that a lot of people use, but not everyone, what, what one person loves, another person hates. So <laughs> the best is a hard word to use. Um, and basically, you're going to need to just kind of dabble. You're going to need to look around, find what your children like the most. If they're doing remote learning and it's all online and they're really hating the computer aspect, then maybe look for more textbooks based. Um, but do know that the remote learning is a lot different than homeschooling. I know a lot of them have specific times. They have a lot of a workload that is just unrealistic for most school children. Um, so, you know, what you're doing right now is drastically different from homeschooling, even if you go a computer program route. Right. <laughs> it will be drastically different. Right. So, um, just throwing out some things that I thought of what you were talking. Um, one thing that we do try to encourage some, some homeschool parents as they're making that transition from the traditional school into homeschool um, is to de-school yes. for a while. And I know that's a lot of people don't, don't like what in the world is that um it's not unschooling it's just de-schooling which is choosing some learning opportunities that aren't actually curriculum based for maybe a week or two to just kind of withdraw from the traditional mindset and then open up to out of the box ways of learning um, I think Andrea and I kind of incorporate a lot of different out of the box things in what we do. And um, sometimes it's hard. I mean, we're both, we both come from that traditional education mindset. We both had classrooms and then <laughs> we started homeschooling. I started homeschooling. I thought I could put, I had four kids when I started. 
I thought I could make me a little classroom in my home and everybody have a little desk and use the chalkboard and have the schedule system on. You yeah. were making your own little homeschool house, the one room classroom. I thought it was. You had the Anna Green Gables moment. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> well, it didn't work, especially when I had a baby and that baby crawled all over and wrote on all their homework pages and yes. slobbered on their pencils. <laughs> And they just get tired of each other because they're stuck in that same room with each other the entire day and it just becomes so much like it's the tension in that room is just exactly. yeah we've been there <laughs> mine were really young when i attempted that so luckily they don't remember a lot of it but <laughs> <laughs> mommy has scarred they are not which is a good thing but yeah, yeah uh, the flexibility um especially and this can help you kind of get an idea of where your child is at even though they're on a grade level right now doing their learning they may not be where you think mm -hmm. they are and so games are one of the number one things that I can point to, um, you know, try, try to pull educational games, even if it's not something that's technically educational, all games have an education component, component to it. Uh, even if you're just playing Clue, they're using, you know, deductive reasoning. You, you can kind of figure out where your child is on lots of different things, but from reading to math to, to science, depending on what kind of trivia you're doing or what kind of pro what you're using, and you can get an idea of where they are and so they're still learning they're still working but it's not school that you that fits in the box you're not fitting in the box you're out of the box <laughs> um, another one that's really great for that is use your television find something interesting that you both enjoy you know binge watch that National Geographic episode and they will talk to you a lot about whatever it is and ask questions and you'll find out where they are and what they like and what they don't like and you can kind of go from there to see um, what you need to do and what they're curious in and what you can kind of build out from yeah so lots of lots of alternative mm -hmm. ways makes it fun oh i see sarah the other sarah the first sarah commented yeah. that she did that too yeah it really does help and then um a lot of people suggest to then break in easily kind of slowly into One more regular time. learning and into, <laughs> right, into a habit, into a daily routine, which that's, I don't know, maybe we can touch on that now. Um, that's what we do. I'm guessing it kind of sounds like that's kind of what you do. We don't have this cemented schedule that we follow, but we have a routine that we do. We started off, and again, I started off really home, really school yeah. at home oriented because that's where my brain was. And so I actually schooled at home for a good year to two before I realized this isn't a good idea. And then I had to de-school myself <laughs> because my kids hadn't been, they didn't yeah. know it was me. So I needed the de-schooling mo moment, which was fine. And so we went from a very flexible schedule you know these are what we're going to we're going to do on super uh, on certain days but my kids now are in the preteen stage to where they're the independent learning has greatly increased which is wonderful um <laughs> i love this stage <laughs> and so you know we have daily goals this is what you need to do and here's what you need to do before you can do xyz that you want to do and so we have a block set time of you need to do your stuff within a certain time I'm available for questions. I'm available for help. I'm available for if it's a one on one, if we're doing a social studies or a science thing that they, you know, I have to be there or they're going to blow up the kitchen. <laughs> you know, it's, it's those kind of moments that, you know, we, we schedule a little more, you know, not down to the minute, but, you know, within these right. hours. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so, and with your schedule, along with everything in homeschool, it's flexible. You, you pick that to be what you need it to be. And when you're starting out, you may not think that you're an afternoon homeschooler, but give it a try for a couple of days. Maybe that fits better for you. Just because you're so programmed for 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. doesn't mean it has to stay that way. Um, you know, what, if you're not morning people, don't force it. Don't. You're just going to hurt everyone. <laughs> if someone's going to be grumpy. There's not enough coffee in the world. So, <laughs> so take, take, it, take it easy and, and test the waters. I mean, this, this homeschooling is a giant experiment. And all you know, it's it's what works for you. You experiment to figure out what works for each children, each of your children. I mean, I have one that's an early morning. I have one that's a late evening. Mm -hmm. It makes a long day for mom, but <laughs> they learn better during those times. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you work with what what your children need. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had a thought while you were talking, and I just lost it. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Oh. 
know what it was. I recently, yeah. oh, there's another question. Okay, one second. I, like this one. I recently <laughs> saw this homeschool kind of, kind of a scheduling idea that I thought was pretty amazing. Um, it appealed to me because I think I'm this kind of learner. Uh, but anyway, it was, what is that? Like, a, is it a Kandan chart? Have you heard of that? I've heard of that. Like we have put all, what they did was they used a whiteboard and they divided it into three parts. And on the far left, that whole section, they wrote everything they needed to do um, that week in their homeschool lessons, whatever tasks, assignments, projects, they're written on little individual sticky notes. And then uh, the student could decide what they wanted to do that day. So they could take the sticky notes they liked and put them on the, that, the to do today. Okay. And then, and then, and then, but that's kind of what yeah. we do. <laughs> and when know, they finished it, they just put it into the yeah. stick it on the finished column. And so it was kind of a pictorial representation of what you had to do today and completion. You know, yeah. so that really appealed to me. I like to put things in a completed call. I really like the loop <laughs> scheduling too. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. I like listing it and then just kind of going in a, in a circle. That way it's for us, if we get too much in a zone of repeat, we just kind of end up getting frustrated. <clears throat> if every Tuesday is the same thing, you know, we get bored. So that you list what you want, your subjects or, you know, art, math, whatever, what needs to be done. And then as you finish that, you go back up. So you may not have, you know, math every week or every other day or whatever it needs to be, but when you get back to it and so that you're continuously building, but it's not a continuous monotonous yeah, kind every of thing. Day it's, it's, you know, there's it's different. different. And you can throw something interesting, you know, game day in the middle of it. And then when you get back to game day, yay, it took us a week and a half, but we're here. <laughs> you know, and that's something to look forward to. And that way they're still working towards a goal. And so, um, I really like, this is second Sarah. Mm -hmm. Second Sarah? Second Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah. Um, is there a way that I can include my three-year-old in homeschooling that won't slow down my first and third grader? Yes. <laughs> um, I highly recommend finding educational hands-on Dollar Tree will be your friend. Um, little tools, letters, numbers, um, stuff like they. Your three-year-old can play and build with that, and they will continually listen into what you're doing with your first and third grader, and you'll be surprised how much they'll pick up. <laughs> um, my my children are about two years apart, and so I definitely had that with my second child. Um, she picked up so much stuff that I didn't even realize she she went above and beyond her brother at one point <laughs> because she had picked up so much wow. information. So um, hands-on manipulatives, if you're cool with Play-Doh, Play-Doh is a great thing for them to sit there and play with while you're doing your lessons. Um, and even if you give them a pen and paper and just give them a job, you know, just your job is just to write down things and, you know, you're going to draw a picture during this. Give them something that they think is important and special for them. Mm -hmm. And they will sit there that entire time, but they will be absorbing every single thing that you were saying and doing. <laughs> so, so it's, it's a double whammy. You get a bonus learning with that. <laughs> uh -huh. One thing that I did with my preschoolers while I was teaching, um, I, I created two baskets and I used a lot of what you said um, from the Dollar Tree, those little magic slates that are now they have on their plastic and you just write on them and then you can do the little bottom thing back and forth to erase. I would put that and all kinds of different things in the two baskets. One basket I would hide. They wouldn't see it for a while while they were using the first basket. When they got tired of the first basket, I would put that one up and bring out the second basket until they got tired of that. And it seemed like that worked pretty well as far as keeping them interested in those simple little learning things yeah. that they played with. It's very much so. Yeah. yeah, so that was a great thing. Okay, so back to getting started with homeschooling. Um, we gave her some tips. Uh, one of the things that I thought I would mention is that, um, I think it was Griselda that asked that question, wasn't it? Yeah. That there is a, right on the homepage of homeschool.com, there is the hero image has a little click through yellow button. There's a how to start homeschooling, very basic four steps right there. If you need a little bit more, the first article right below that has about six steps that really help bring you into even uh, just work through some things. You know, I was talking to um, 
a lady had emailed me this morning and asked if I would be her go-to homeschool mom. <laughs> and I said, sure, I'll do that. I'll help you. And she's like, so tell me, I've, I, I know I want to start homeschooling. I just don't know what to do next. And so I gave her those steps, just kind of a simplified version of them. But the first thing you want to do is kind of do some homework, some mom homework, I call it. And, and look at, first of all, your why. Why do you want to homeschool? What's your purpose? What, what's your reason? And you know, if right now you have, you're just getting started, you're getting into this, your purpose is going to be pretty passionate. And I encourage you to write that down because someday in the near future, <laughs> you're going to get, <laughs> see, she's laughing. She knows you're going to get tired. Your kids are going to drive you crazy. You are going to say, what in the world was I thinking? And why did I even start homeschooling? And that piece of paper is going to be that little golden nugget that's because you can whip out and remind yourself, okay, that is why I started. That's right. That's right. And maybe that passion that you have right now can transfer into your reminder later on. So I encourage you to do that. And then secondly, look at how you want to accomplish this. I mean, we've talked about it and Andrea even shared really the meat of that is um, what speaks to you? What kind of family are you? Are you relaxed and kind of chill, natural kind of people? You like hikes and nature? Then you might want to consider like a natural style or method of teaching like Charlotte Mason or something like that. Um, but if you're real techie and you love computers and all that good stuff, then that fits your family and fits your kids' desires. Then you're going to want to look for those kind of things because that's what's going to make you happy. And then, you know, if you're a very um, traditional mindset or very detail oriented and love schedules, <laughs> which <laughs> they killed me, but if you do because everybody's different, then you need to to work your homeschool in that way. Um, so as Andrea spoke to a while back, that your unique family personality, your child's unique needs, that is what should dictate your homeschool. You make homeschool work yes. for you and not the other way around. Don't be a slave to somebody else's method or style or what somebody else says you need to be doing. And it's a nice balance. You also have to, you know, you're, your preference sometimes won't always mesh with your child's preference. Yeah. And so sometimes there is a fine line you have to run with how much of each personality, because I don't know if you're like me, you have at least one kid that has the opposite personality of you. And so you, if you are the main teacher and this is what you're going to be doing, you have to kind of compromise with what you're going to do when you're going to do it. Because if you force your personality on your child, you're just going to get pushed back. It's just going to be, parenting times 1000 because <laughs> you are a teacher too you have different hats you have to put on your different hat for each one and so you at some point when they're younger you're it's easier to get by with it um, but as they get older you have to kind of come to that moment of how much am i going to you know what am i what's going to give something's got to give and so um we do the end of the year kind of resolution reflection over on A to Z. We have printables over there for that. And I have made some for the homeschoolers as well. So they can put in what they like, what they don't like. And you can drill down into their their wants and needs. Yeah. That can help you kind of plan in and say, oh, okay, well, I never knew my kid enjoyed this part yeah. of this so much. Because sometimes they don't say that. Yeah. And so, if you know, if for that, you know, it's a kind of a family thing. You do yours, they do theirs, and you can share. And it, it brings them in with it. And that way, you kind of get out of your headspace some yeah. and kind of see where they are. It's not something that's going to happen your first year homeschooling. Probably not even your second. Maybe your third. Because you have to get to know each other. You have to get to know what you're comfortable with, what you like, what you don't like, and how you like best. Um, so just to speak to what you said right there, a lot of the people that I know who homeschool would all agree that the first year tends to be a little bit of a mess. Yes. Well, that's, <laughs> and, that's yeah. kind of my um, advice for anyone. Your first year is your trial year. It is everything you do is a 14 you know, day trial. <laughs> try it for two weeks to a month. If it doesn't work, toss it out and try again. It's okay. 
They're not going to be behind so far that they can't catch up. It's not going to be detrimental for them for the rest of their life. They're not going to lose a year. You know, nothing major. The world's not going to explode, I promise. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they will. It'll be fine. They're still learning as you go along. And they're learning how to, to meet their own needs. You're teaching them not to stick with something that, that isn't working. And so, you know, you're showing them how to fail successfully. Right. <laughs> it's like, oh, this failed, Absolutely. so we're going to successfully move on. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's it's that quote, you know, I've tried, I haven't failed. I've just tried a thousand different ways. It's not working. So, and that's the mindset you just have to have is this one's not working. Let's move on. And so it's it's a really good life skill that you're imparting. So if you if you get in the middle of that and you think, you know, I've tried 15 things and it's not working, they're learning that that's okay. They're learning to try the next new thing, just do the next next right thing <laughs> and go on. Absolutely. I do want to throw out too that on homeschool.com, we have two, actually three, um, what we call a quiz, a diagnostic quiz that you can take. Um, the first one will help you. And again, it will help you. It's not going to be, um, it may not be definitely 100%. You might take it two or three times and find out you have different um, aspects. Um, so the first quiz is the homeschool styles or methods. The second quiz is your child's learning style or preference. And the third quiz is your the curriculum that aligns with your, your style or teaching method and your child's learning style. So um, those three quizzes kind of help guide you. Um, but like I said, you could take them a couple times and might come out with a different response. You know what that tells me is that you may be what we kind of call an eclectic yes. homeschooler where you like a lot of different approaches um and in, if that's the case you exploring different things might be what you need to do and that is uh, the majority of homeschoolers so don't feel like you're in the yeah. you know wrong spot that mm -hmm. i know a lot of homeschoolers initially start on one path and then they kind of end up in the eclectic zone and that's what i hear from almost all of the veteran homeschoolers i talk to you know we started off charlotte mason all the way and then by the end we were this hodgepodge of everything and it worked so you know, it, as you get more comfortable, you will also be more comfortable of kind of going out of your comfort zones and trying different things and finding different things that work. Um, and also with those quizzes, I know I've taken them before multiple times. Over the years, you're going to change and your children are going to change. So, you know, that's that's one of the biggest things that I wasn't prepared for. I wasn't prepared for how much our learning styles mm -hmm. were going to change and how much, you know, curriculum we loved two years ago just don't finish up now. It's just not the same. And so be prepared that, you know, even if you love it this year, you may not love it five years from now. So, you know, don't buy it all at once. <laughs> that, that's the big takeaway. Don't buy all of it. Right. <laughs> year to time works. Year right. to time and works. that's another thing, a good point to speak to is that I, I don't know about you, but over the years, I like to sell my curriculum. Yeah. It helps me buy the next year's curriculum, okay. you know, and of course, Initially, I thought, well, I'm going to save all this stuff that my older kids used and I'm going to use it later. Well, exactly what you just said, Andrea, as my, my, all the kids have different personalities and what worked for one might not work for another. So I really come to find out that, you know, unless they're like basic readers, <laughs> it might work. It might not. I'm not sure if I want to hang on to it. So sometimes I do. Sometimes the next year I sell it right off and, and then I use that money to help finance the, the new yeah. year's curriculum. So uh, places like eBay, OfferUp, those kind of Facebook marketplace, those are all really great. He has a classified group yeah. as well and there's a lot of people that do the same thing. Yeah. They sell theirs every year. So Yeah, that's awesome. So using something like that helps a lot. Um, anything else on the getting started? I think we've kind of worked all the way through and then of course the curriculum what curriculum you use you kind of tie that into your uh, your method your child's learning preferences we also have a, a nice um, big collection of a lot of the curriculum offerings that are out there which are many um, and we've tried to organize them with a search tool and if you go to homeschool.com and click on the curriculum button on the menu navigation you'll find it it's it's called a resource guide I like to call it a curriculum finder 
but it helps you search with parameters, like what your homeschool method is, if it's Charlotte Mason or if it's traditional or, and then it lets you also select things like online versus books or DVDs and things like that. So that can be really helpful in narrowing down or even discovering new resources that you've never heard before. So also if you find a new resource, and I'm throwing this out there too for you, Andrea, let me know because we're constantly adding to it um, because there's always something new being created. So across some new ones I need to send okay. you away. So. Okay. <laughs> Good. So we keep adding to it to help um, homeschoolers discover those new things too. So that's there. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and answer this Sarah's question about high school. Um, she said, her son is in 10th grade and still in algebra one. Um, you know what? <laughs> that, that can go a lot of different ways. I know it's probably, it may be frustrating to you. Um, maybe you feel like he's, he's behind in your mind. Um, but then again, on the other hand, I look at it as why do we always think we have to do certain things at certain times? I kind of tend to, um, mix things up a little bit. And I learned this the hard way. My youngest, um, you know, I've already shared with everybody that I was a teacher. And so I kind of had it in my mind with my first, first child, my second child, they all read at like four, you know, and I thought, oh, wow, this is easy. You know, I was on a roll. Um, I had a set of twins. I actually have five girls with one boy. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> My boy threw the curve, threw the curve on everything. Um, so he taught me a lot of things. But then my last child had dyslexia. And so I really had to come to terms with not everybody fits in into my preconceived ideas or expectations. And so she didn't read until she was in second grade. And that just made me realize, you know, that's fine. When she hit second grade and it it all clicked she reads wonderful now and she enjoys it. Um, so I kind of look at that the same way I have, I have a high school student right now who is struggling with math. Math is not her favorite subject at all. Um, there are some things that you can do if you are really concerned and want to catch them up. Um, things like Alex math are helpful time for learning.com. Um, that is that's an online curriculum that allows you to work at your own pace so if your student um, is really wanting to get into you know get through algebra maybe get into geometry or algebra 2 um, just for time's sake then that may be a way to go but if they're struggling i would probably use whatever curriculum you're using and alex math or something like that that can give them a double duty to help them overcome if, some of the challenges if you're also if you're open to technology and using things like that um, dragon box apps yeah. things like that that you can kind of supplemental on and it depends on where the holdup is that they're having problem. Algebra is one of my favorite things. So I'm not a math mind as much as Jamie. I love math, but <laughs> I don't have a high schooler. But I know for me personally, um, you know, it depends on where they're having, you know, issues at. If maybe they need a more visual representation mm -hmm. and there's lots of different curriculums that you might, or even just sites or extra supplemental things you can add in to help them visualize what's right. happening. Because I know a lot of, that's a sticking point for a lot of people. And then if you still are up against the wall, you know, may, maybe put it to the side, try a different map, try geometry for a bit, try something else. Mm -hmm. I know I was the opposite. I was the anti-geometry person. My brain still doesn't work that way very well. And, but algebra, I can do all day. Trig, I can I'm fine. <laughs> Even bring me calculus. But, you know, just that might just be the part that not, you know, not everybody's good at everything. And so that might be the part where they, they're going to trudge through it. They'll get there it won't be perfect. It won't, it won't be their, their yeah. golden thing. And so, you know, we all, we all have our strengths and weaknesses and maybe that's just going to be where, where there's is at. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> and, and then, you know, that's, that's where you pick your curriculum or your career to go from that. I mean, if, if math's not your, your thing, then, you know, that's not going to be something you're going to want to do when you get older anyway. So don't be bogged down by the fact that they can't, they're trying, you know, do what you can, but if you still can't get it, it's okay. It's okay. And they may pick it up later. If they decide to go to college, they may pick it up then. I know that was history for me 
I was not great at it at all, got to college and loved it. So, you know, it may just be something that you need to, your brain to be older before you can pick it up. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, we, we have this expectation that by the time we get to our teens, our brain's ready to absorb all this stuff. It's not like that for everyone. And so, you know, that they may need a few extra years and a change of pace to, to be able to pick right. this. One thing that I found when, when I tutored math for high school students was a lot of times young men had difficulty with the basic algebra, but they enjoyed yeah. geometry. And you could teach those same, there's algebraic principles within geometry as well, but you can have some more uh, concrete representations like shapes and perimeter and area, things that, that you can mm -hmm. manipulate, I guess, or be a little bit more hands-on with. Um, I did find that out with several young men that I tutored through high <laughs> school. They liked geometry better. And sometimes we would um, switch the order. And that may be yeah. something that you might want to consider. Maybe let, like Andrea mentioned, let him do geometry and really find a little success if he does well with that. And then go back and complete some of the things in, in and algebra then if you're still struggling with both maybe back up a little bit maybe there's some concepts that you know wasn't fully cemented before you moved mm -hmm. on to that and so maybe a review I mean just basic reviews I know with my kids you know just basic addition facts multiplication facts division facts once you move on to higher math it's easier if you have those memorized and done and ready yeah. so maybe that's a sticking point the frustrations happening when it comes to easy you know computations of numbers instead of the actual formula formulas and putting it together so it's just finding where that problem is um, she says that they're currently using time for learning so I would suggest looking at maybe some of the hands-on um, and that there was some of my brain early and I can't think of them now <laughs> but um, there are there are different ones that especially the other apps the dragon box app yeah. definitely you get the visual re representation especially of the balancing of your um, algebra equations that might help so I would definitely look into that. Um, I know that math you see. That's is, it. Yeah. <laughs> the -on, um, I wanted to say that, but I wasn't sure. It sounded weird in my brain. So <laughs> um, we did time for learning last year for algebra one as well. And I do have to admit my math non-lover <laughs> didn't, didn't do too well. I used Khan Academy and then I tried to tutor her myself, but an outside tutor might be another option. Um, but she, she had to hear it taught in a couple different ways before she got it. Um, so sometimes the time for learning teacher would go through it one way and teach it from this perspective. Um, sometimes Khan Academy, what's his name, Sal? <laughs> Mm -hmm. He would get it from another perspective, and if neither of those worked, I would try to teach her, find a way that I could do it as hands-on as and possible. And look into, you, there's um, the algebra, algebra Tutor on YouTube, I think is his name. It might be the Math Tutor on YouTube. He puts out, he's a professional tutor that puts out a lot of informative, and I know a lot of my friends that went back to college use those for, for refreshers on things. So maybe even it's just, you know, when it's when he hits the block, the block and can't go any further, watch a couple of those videos. Mm -hmm. Maybe just watching someone else go through them might help. That's different than what's currently yeah. being shown. So, yep. Well, I guess we need to try to wrap this up. We have been on here almost an yeah. hour already. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe how fast time went. Um, but yeah, if anybody else that's on the video with us has questions. Go ahead and um, add them to the comments even after the, the live is over and we can answer them for you. And you um, so you can also reach out to me on um, A to Z homeschooling. My email's on there or through the Facebook um, page, whatever you want to do. We'll try our best to point you in the correct direction and get you answers. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Andrea, thanks, thanks so much for spending an hour with me <laughs> and all these lovely ladies. Anytime. <laughs> and, <laughs> Happy to do it. So, uh, before we go, I'm just going to, I got to check okay. my calendar really quick just to make sure that I'm not making this up here. Um, next week on the 27th at three o'clock, we're going to do another Facebook live. So if anybody is here, wants to join us for that, um, that one's going to be on a different topic. 
And so we're going to try to be um, real specific about different topics. But of course, any questions that are asked, we will try to answer them. So, all right, everybody have a great day. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.